started. Um, we're continuing to talk about some topics in Chapter 7 of the textbook, so hopefully you've already ordered that one. Um, homework 1 is due on Wednesday next week. Of course, we won't have class on Monday of next week, so we'll have today's lecture, Monday's lecture, and the assignments due before class on Wednesday. So it's just today and uh, Friday of this week that we're going to be going over things that tie into the homework assignment. So any questions before we get started? I'll point out that I've loaded the lecture notes onto Blackboard. And those are uh, available in a variety of formats. You know, like if you prefer to have the full slide or multiple slides per page. Uh, if you want to print those out, that can be a good habit, you know, to have them available and take notes on top of it. Um, maybe put it in a binder or something like that. Um, so last time we finished by looking at the Moody diagram. And just to refresh your memory on how we used it, because you're going to need this for the homework assignment. We started by determining the Reynolds number. So if you know the flow through a pipe, and you know the viscosity or kinematic viscosity of the fluid and the diameter of the pipe, you can calculate the Reynolds number. So in the case of that example that we worked last time, it was 1.25 times 10 to the fifth was the Reynolds number. So a vertical line here corresponding to the Reynolds number. Next, we determine the relative roughness, which is the equivalent sand roughness of the pipe material, um, divided by the diameter of the pipe. And you have to be careful about the units, because they, they should be the same units. If this is a ratio, the equivalent sand roughness in millimeters means that your pipe diameter should also be in millimeters. On the homework assignment, you're going to be working in traditional units. So I think that the uh, pipe roughness is expressed in terms of feet. So you'd need to also have the pipe diameter expressed in terms of feet. So you'll, do needs, uh, you'll need to do some units conversions along the way. But in our example, we had a relative roughness of about 0 0.001. So we follow that curve as it slopes upward. And the point of intersection between the two is where we then went over to the secondary axis on the left side and found that the friction factor was 0 0.022. OK, so we'll use that on the homework assignment. Just wanted to go over it another time. Before we get into some problem solving, I thought I'd show you some pretty pictures. Um, I showed you Lake Oroville before. Um, this is a, a man-made lake in Northern California that, like everything out west has uh, really suffered from the drought in recent years. You can see that in 2011 the reservoir was nice and full. It may be full again now because they had a pretty good water year last winter. Uh, but then, you know, for about a decade the water levels were so low that, um, you know, boating was just basically a puddle. Um, you can see the water levels rise and fall and some aspects of the bridge support that you wouldn't normally see are completely exposed during dry wa uh, weather. This is a really interesting lake and dam. Um, to, to point out last year how much the uh, water levels changed in just a couple of weeks, the water level on December 26th, this was 22, uh, 673 feet. And then by January 9th, the water level was up to 735 feet. So just in a couple of weeks, the water le level went up uh, 62 feet, which is just a tremendous amount of water. They really had a lot of snow last year in the Sierra Nevadas. So you can see um, portions that were completely exposed are well underwater again. Um, so the dam that creates this reservoir, it's the tallest dam in the United States from the height of the top of the dam to where the water comes out at the bottom, 770 feet. And it's the second largest man-made lake in California. Uh, they use it for a variety of purposes, for providing recreational benefits to the people there. Uh, it's used to help irrigate crops in the Central Valley of California. And it's also used to generate hydroelectric power. And so their priority, when there's water that needs to be released from the dam, they're first going to send the water through the hydropower plant. And it can take up to a flow of 
16,960 cubic feet per second. Uh, there's also a bypass that doesn't go through the hydropower system and not the spillway, just a secondary bypass that has about 5,000 CFS of capacity. Now this concrete chute is the service spillway and um, you know it's nicely armored, it's designed to carry flow if needed and uh, it has a stated capacity of 270,000 cubic feet per second and water would only flow through that spillway if the water gets up to about 814 feet and so it's uh, it's not released you know through the depths it's it's an overflow and then the emergency spillway is over here on the far left side um, if there's so much water coming into the uh, to the lake that they're worried about water overtopping the dam which would be really bad because if water goes over the top of the dam uh, it's going to cause scour and you know, the dam itself could fail and so rather than have the water go over the top of the dam they create another location where they'd rather have the water go if things really get out of control. And so that emergency spillway starts when the water levels up to 901 feet. Um, so they had an incident back in 2017 where it was very wet in February. A lot of rain came all at once and uh, there was about 130,000 to 190,000 CFS of water that needed to be released and so that's more than can go through the power plant that's more than can go through the bypass and so once you're having all the water possible go through both of those they need to send some of the water down the emergency spillway and it had been a while since conditions were that wet so quickly in northern california so the spillway hadn't been used in a while and um, this is what it looks like under normal circumstances but there was an issue. Uh, there was a, a concrete fault where just even the smallest defect, water's going to find a way to get in there. It's going to begin scouring material out. Cavitation can occur when velocities are really high. And that's where there's a, a small shock wave that's being sent through the water due to negative pressures. And it chips away at the concrete. And uh, the hole progressively got worse. And so they had to close the spillway gates to kind of look around and send people down there just to give you an idea of the scale of this hole. Uh, these are people climbing down in to inspect. And the situation was uh, pretty desperate. Um, they had to just open the spillway up again because remember, they can't let the water go over the dam. If the dam breaks, there's uh, communities downstream that are really threatened by a sudden release of water from this lake. And in fact, there were tens of thousands of people who got evacuated just from the risk that the dam was maybe going to fail. Um, but even though the, uh, the spillway was failing, they still had to just open it up. The water has to go somewhere, and you can see it's carving away the hillside. Some of it's going through the spillway. Most of it's uh, going on other ground. There's also water being released from the emergency spillway at this point. And so it's flowing over the hillside, going to cause a lot of damage. Part of the damage that it does isn't just scouring the, um, the soil, but it's also depositing that same sediment into the stream. And there are a lot of aquatic species that can't handle the sediment. You know, it's a water quality issue that can kill fish and um, destroy habitat. And um, there was some worry that because it was working in the direction of the dam that, you know, what if it erodes this entire hillside? Because this isn't a, a controlled experiment. They don't know how quickly the hillside is going to be scouring and whether the rain is going to stop in time for uh, the water to be completely discharged. And so out of uh, the wish for caution, they decided to evacuate all the people downstream. And you can kind of see from the brown water there that there's soil entrained in that water and it's an indicator that there's some damage being done. So this is just another look at the dam spillway and the emergency spillway and um, this rock was supposed to protect the dam from any scour and it would up close to the dam itself but further down the rock wasn't as secure and uh, so that's why the uh, 
the scour happened. Th here's the emergency spillway in operation, and you can see it doing quite a bit of damage to this hillside as the water's flowing over the top there. Um, people were hopeful that the, uh, the dam wouldn't collapse because of that ridge, but uh, they just weren't quite sure when the rain was going to let up. So it was a, a few harrowing days. Here they've exaggerated the, um, the vertical elevation so that you can kind of see the path that the water was taking down to the river as it went over the emergency spillway. A lot of damage to the hillside and vegetation there. And then when it finally did stop flowing, you can see all of this rock and sediment in the river. This is a fan of material deposited in the stream that wasn't there before. It changes the flow patterns. The river is very brown and silty. and So um, the repair cost, I think, initially was estimated to be $1.1 billion. It may have gone up. Projects like this tend to. Um, but it's just kind of an illustration of the awesome power of water that's moving quickly with high elevations and energy being expended. This is, you know, today we're going to be talking about resistance to flow and shear stress applied either by the pipe material or stream to the water or, you know, the reverse of that is water applying a force to stationary materials and carrying them downstream. And so this is a really interesting case study of what can go wrong uh, when unexpected events come together. Low probability but high impact. Um, the Association of State Dam Highway Afi wait, State Dam Safety Officials they did a, an analysis after the fact and they said that it was uh, a combination of things. It was a failure to recognize and address spillway design and construction weaknesses. So it was both um, poor design and poor construction techniques. Um, the uh, the quality of the bedrock wasn't what people had assumed it was, and then the uh, deteriorated service spillway chute conditions. And so there were a couple of people who years prior to this raised concerns about the safety of the dam, but you know those whistleblowers were ignored, the problems were swept under the rug, and eventually the unexpected happens and there was quite a lot of damage. I, I'm not aware of any deaths, and so really fortunate that it was just an economic issue and not necessarily a, a big disaster that claimed a lot of lives. Uh, the biggest dam failure in U.S. history isn't far from here, um, Johnstown, Pennsylvania, back in, I think around 1900, and uh, thousands of people died when that dam failed. All right, we already went over that example. Now this is uh, one of the problems on your homework. And I just wanted to go over a couple of things at the outset, just maybe give you a couple of hints on how to solve this one, point you in the right direction before I turn you loose. So what we have is an elevated water tank, and it's carrying water through a pipeline to a building. And what we want to know is we want to have at the top of this building, which has an elevation of 100 feet, we want the pressure to be 30 PSI. And then through this pipeline, the water is going to be flowing, it says, at 1,000 GPM. Do you know what GPM is? Gallons, Gallons per minute. minute. Right. So you're going to be using the Darcy-Wiesbach equation to determine how much energy loss there is due to pipe friction as the water is flowing through there. And here's the energy equation that allows you to determine how high the water surface elevation needs to be inside of the tank. And so the tank is location one, and the building is location two. When we use the energy equation, one is always upstream, two is downstream. So what we're going to say is that the pressure of the water at the interface of the air and the liquid here at location one, location one is at the air-water interface. So that's one, and the pressure there is zero. So you'll be able to cancel out that first term, P1 divided by gamma. Z1 is the unknown. That's the elevation of the water. V1 divided by 2G, that means the velocity at the location in the tank. It's not talking about the velocity of the water in the pipe. V1 means just 
the water in the tank. And we're just going to assume that the water in the tank, you know, maybe the water level is going down a little bit, but so slowly that it can be neglected. So the V1 term is also canceled out. In the energy equation, does anybody remember what the H sub P term stands for? That would be the head that is uh, being applied by a pump. And this system doesn't have any pump. So it's on the left-hand side of the equation because that's energy that's being added as the water goes from 1 to 2. And here there's no pump, so that term is going to cancel out. Okay, now P2 means the pressure at the top of this building. And we want the water pressure to be 30 PSI. So this is a units problem in addition to everything else where you're going to have to be putting the... Uh, numbers into this equation in uh, the correct units. And so I'm telling you the pressure in PSI. Gamma is the unit weight of water. And in traditional units, the unit weight of water is 62.4 pounds of force per cubic foot. So if I give you the pressure in PSI, what are you going to have to convert it to to be able to divide it by gamma? If the pressure is PSI, and of course we know PSI means pounds of force per inch squared. So if I have pressure divided by the unit weight, how do you have to change the pressure? What units should the pressure be in to be able to put it in an expression like that? Pounds per square foot. That's right. Pounds per square, uh, pounds per square foot, yes. So if you divide pounds per square foot by... Uh, pounds per cubic foot, then that would have units of feet. And all three of these terms in the energy equation, this is us expressing the energy equation in terms of uh, length. Each of those three terms on the left side, the right side, should have units of length. So it'll be feet, which is what we want. So point is, you're going to have to convert this pressure of 30 PSI to PSF. How do you do that? If you've got one foot by one foot, how many square inches are there in one foot by one foot? 144 uh, inches, square, inches squared per foot squared. Right, so convert it by multiplying by 144. Okay, so we've talked about the pressure head at 2, the elevation at 2, neglect the velocity head at 2. We're not talking about the water flowing through the pipeline. We're just talking about like the water sitting in a tap before you turn the tap on at the top of the building. So we'll say V2 is also 0. The last term here, head loss due to pipe friction, we'll use the Darcy-Wiesbach equation to calculate that. So L is the length of the pipe. We're told that that's 5,000 feet. V is the velocity of flow through the pipe. Have you been given enough information in the problem statement to calculate the velocity of flow through the pipe? It's not zero. Water is going to be flowing through the pipe. Although we said the velocity in the tank is zero because you know, the tank is big. It's got a large diameter. So even if the water level is going down a little bit, like a bathtub, you know, like a bathtub drains slowly. But the water that's coming out of the pipe from a bathtub, that's moving at a good velocity, even though the water level is negligible. So we're neglecting the velocity in the tank. Um, and we want to calculate the pressure in the tap at the top of the building. Water's maybe being drawn from other places inside of the building, but we're just going to say conditions at 2 are static. But the velocity through the pipe, what's the uh, continuity equation? Does that ring a bell from fluid mechanics, the continuity equation? Um, Q equals V times A. And so we can rearrange that. And the velocity of flow through a pipe is the volumetric flow rate divided by the cross-sectional area. So what we know here is we've got 1,000 GPM 
which you could convert that Q into cubic feet per second. Those unit conversions exist. And in fact, they're given, among other places, at the beginning of your textbook. So converting from GPM to CFS, cubic feet per second. So that defines Q. What about the cross-sectional area, the, the area through which the water is flowing in the pipe? Well, we're told the diameter of the pipe is 12 inches. So if you know the diameter, you can calculate A because A is pi d squared divided by 4. So you've got everything you need in this problem to calculate the, uh, the velocity. And then what about F? It says here to use the Moody diagram. So I've already summarized that process. You're determining the Reynolds number. This is getting busy on the board here. Let me just erase some of these hints. I like to calculate the Reynolds number as the velocity times the diameter of the pipe divided by the kinematic viscosity of the fluid. So we know the velocity of flow through the pipe. It's just volumetric flow rate divided by the area. We know the diameter of the pipe is one foot. Kinematic viscosity of water. We can look that up in the textbook. There's a table on page 35. It's got fluid properties in SI units and in BG units. And so it says here that this is water at 60 degrees Fahrenheit. And so water at 60 degrees Fahrenheit, if we go to the table and find kinematic viscosity, it says it's 1.217 times 10 to the minus fifth feet squared per second. Okay, so we can calculate the Reynolds number. That gives us the vertical component on the Moody diagram. Uh, it says here that it's cast iron and the epsilon is 0 0.00085. So the relative roughness is just epsilon divided by pipe diameter. And then that's what we would use to determine the relative roughness. And so from all of that, you can get the uh, friction factor. And then calculate H sub F. H sub F represents how much energy was lost as water's flowing through the pipe. So how tall does the water level need to be? Well, it needs to be at least 100 feet, or water's not going to flow from the tank to the building. So it's going to be 100 feet plus some additional elevation related to how much pressure we want in there. So it's got to be high to pressurize it. So part of the head that we're adding is P2 divided by gamma. And then the last out elevation we have to add is how much energy is required to overcome the pipe friction, H sub F. So there's going to be three terms when you calculate how high does Z1 need to be. It's got to be Z2 plus P2 divided by gamma plus H sub F. So those three things determine how high the water level needs to be in the elevated tank. So any questions about that before we move on? OK, well, if you need a recap, remember that these videos are posted online. So you can come back and listen to that again after you've maybe wrestled with some of the numbers a little bit. Let's talk about water flowing through a pipe at kind of a fundamental level. Um, if we have water flowing through a circular pipe, this is a diagram of the water itself. So if, if we had x-ray vision and we can see through the pipe and just look at the water, that's what we're doing here. There's a pipe, but we're not seeing the pipe, we're just seeing the water. And what we want to do is consider the forces that are acting on that element of water. It's a certain amount of water that's flowing through the pipe. On one side of it is the pressure in the pipe pressing against the cross-sectional area of that element. So this is like an external pressure. If we're just doing a, uh, if we're looking at a control volume and we're looking at the forces that are external that are being applied, pressure in the direction of flow 
times the cross-sectional area is one of the forces. On the other side, um, the pressure downstream, which is in the opposite direction because uh, the forces act normal to the uh, control surface that we're cutting here. So that's resisting the movement. There's the weight of the water acting downward. And so if this is an inclined um, element of water, then we'd have to know the angle that it was inclined. And then the force that's acting in the direction of flow would be uh, sine of alpha times gamma times L times A. So L times A is the uh, volume of water that's here. A is the cross-sectional area. L is the length of this segment. So L times A says what's the volume, and then multiplying it by the unit weight tells us the weight of the water. So the weight of the water that's in the direction of flow would then be the unit weight times the volume times sine of alpha. So that's acting in the direction of flow. And then there's this last term here, the shear stress times the perimeter times the length. And you can see the minus sign there and the, the arrow on the diagram says that there's this force that if the water's flowing to the right, if water's flowing from 1 to 2, there's this force that is applied over the outside surface of the water, and it's opposing the direction of flow. So the perimeter times the length gives you the outside surface area of this element of water, because the wetted perimeter here is just the outside difference. It's like the outside ring length. And then L would give you the length between 1 and 2. So if it's like a soup can, the label that goes around the soup can, you can calculate the area of that label by knowing the length and the circumference or perimeter. So here it's saying the shear stress multiplied by the area is the force that's applied to the water that's uh, resisting flow. So it's the friction force. So all of these terms are defined. And what we learned is that if the change in pressure between 1 and 2 is divided by the unit weight, then we think of that as the energy that's lost due to friction. So H sub F is energy lost due to friction. Now R, if we define the hydraulic radius as being the area divided by the wetted perimeter. So for a circular pipe like this, the area would be pi d squared divided by 4, the area of a circle. And the perimeter around there is just pi d. Pi d is the perimeter. So the hydraulic radius, r, is the area pi d squared divided by 4, divided by the wetted perimeter, pi d. And so you can see that terms are going to cancel out. So what we're left with is just um, d divided by 4. So for a circular conduit like this, the hydraulic radius is simply the diameter of the pipe divided by 4. We'll use that simplification from time to time. So keep it in the back of your mind. Um, shear stress multiplied by the length of this liquid segment divided by the unit weight divided by the hydraulic radius that is the energy loss due to friction and we can further substitute in our definition for a circular conduit which is flowing full where the area on the hydraulic radius are both a function of the diameter, then we can substitute that hydraulic radius definition in. And so then here's a relationship that tells us shear stress and energy loss, which we can take just a little bit further in saying if the slope of the energy grade line, a, uh, S sub F, is the head loss relative to length of the pipe, so we're just normalizing it on a per unit length distance. So slope of the energy grade line doesn't have any units. It's just, it's like the slope of how much energy is being lost in the direction of flow. Then here in, in the box term, this is what we use a lot for the, uh, trying to understand the relationship between shear stress and energy loss due to pipe friction. So slope of the EGL. 
So you'll use this in the homework assignment a couple of times. So it's boxed here to help you find it more easily. Um, similar ideas also apply not just to enclosed flow, but also to open channel flow. You know, here in, if there's water flowing through a, a channel, this is the bottom of the channel. And here's the water surface, which is the same as a hydraulic grade line for open channel flow. And above that is the energy grade line, sometimes also called the total energy line. So there's also a shear stress that's being applied to the water by the channel bottom, and it's resisting flow, and it's proportional to the slope of the energy grade line. In the case of the open channel flow, those two are parallel. Uh, the channel bottom and the energy grade line, as long as conditions are steady and uniform. But we're going to focus mainly on pipe flow for now. So let's just work through uh, an example here that uh, takes into account the shear stress being known. If somehow we, uh, we know the shear stress of the water on the pipe and vice versa is 45 newtons per meter squared, and this pipe is inclined upward, so water's flowing from one to two. So water is entering this conduit from the left. It's traveling from left to right, and it comes out at two. So the water's flowing through the pipe, and uh, the diameter is given 150 millimeters, and it's inclined upwards. What we want to know is the slope of the EGL, and we'll use this expression to do that because we are given the shear stress, we know water's unit weight. We can calculate the hydraulic radius based on the diameter of the pipe. So we want to know what is the uh, slope of the energy grade line, and then how much is the pressure going to change over the course of flow through this pipe? OK, so the first thing we want to do is uh, just summarize what's known about this. We've got the diameter of the pipe is 0 0.15 meters. The slope of the pipe itself, S0, that means the slope of the pipe, is 0 0.1 meters per meter. So it's gaining a tenth of a meter of elevation for every horizontal meter that it travels. And then the shear stress that's applied by the water to the pipe and vice versa is 45 newtons per meter squared. Okay, so if we know the diameter, we can calculate the cross-sectional area, pi d squared divided by four. So pi 0 0.15 meters squared divided by four means that our pipe area is 0 0.017671 meters squared. And maybe, I, I've written a bunch of digits here, like how much should you round off? Well, in the problem itself, don't round off. Like keep all the digits in your calculator and then you round off at the very end. So you'd be introducing quite a lot of error if you just rounded this off to 0 0.018 from the beginning. So um, the wetted perimeter here, the wetted perimeter is pi d. So that's 0 0.47124 meters. And the hydraulic radius is area divided by the wetted perimeter. So that's 0 0.01767 meters squared divided by 0 0.47124 meters. So in other words, the hydraulic radius is 0 0.0375 meters. Besides area and wetted perimeter, for a circular conduit flowing full, how, what's the other way we can calculate the hydraulic radius? There's a shortcut. That's right, diameter divided by 4. So what's that? If you actually just take the uh, 0.15 and divide it by 4, anybody have a calculator handy? What is, uh, in this case, D? Is it the same thing, 0 0.0375 meters? OK, good. Our shortcut works. OK, so from all of that, let's just uh, look at the shear stress equation that we're given. We're given this shear stress equation, and we want to know what's the slope of the energy grade line, S sub f. 
There's two different slopes in this problem. There's the slope of the pipe, the slope of the pipe, and the slope of the energy grade line. The pipe is inclined, the EGL is going down. So S sub F, S sub F is the slope of the energy grade line. We can find that by just rearranging the shear stress equation. S sub F is the shear stress divided by gamma times the hydraulic radius. So that's uh, 45 newtons per meter squared divided by, anybody remember what's the unit weight of water in SI units for typical temperature? 62.4 is traditional units. What about SI? Newtons per meter uh, cubed. 32, no, no, that's G. 9810 newtons per meter cubed. All, you'll, you'll memorize so many conversion factors and uh, unit weights coming up. 0 0.0375 meters. Okay, so the slope of the energy grade line is point one, two, two, three, two meters per meter. The slope of the energy grade line. So that's the water is flowing from left to right. Let me bring up my solution and get it recorded into the video here. People really go nuts when I write on the whiteboard and don't include the uh, solution on the screen. All right, so here's where we're at so far. So we calculated the, uh, calculated the slope of the energy grade line. So the conclusion we can draw from this is that it doesn't matter if the pipe is horizontal or if the pipe is inclined or declined, the energy grade line is gonna be going down. The energy grade line and the pipe slope are independent of each other for closed conduit flow. I mean, uh, this is down. This slope is, is downhill and our pipe is uphill. So the second part of the question here was, what's the pressure change over 100 meters of pipe length? So um, we're gonna use the energy equation for that one. So here's the energy equation. And how much does the uh, pressure change between two points? So let's just consider the left part of the pipe is location one, and the right part of the pipe is location two. And let's try and figure out how much the pressure is going to change between those two. So let me write the energy equation. P1 divided by gamma plus Z1 plus V1 squared divided by 2G. Uh, there's no pump. I won't even bother writing the pump term. P2 divided by gamma plus Z2 plus V2 squared divided by 2G plus H sub F, the energy loss due to pipe friction. Okay, um, the pipe diameter is constant. The diameter isn't changing, and so whatever the flow velocity is at 1, it's going to be the same at 2. So we know V1 equals V2, and because of that, it allows me to cancel out the V1 and the V2 terms. And uh, we're going to assume that the elevation here at location 1, let's have let Z1 equals 0. So if Z1 is 0, and this is a 100 meter pipe length, what is Z2 based on the uh, slope of the pipe? If the slope is 0.1 meters of delta Z, 10 meters. 10 meters, good. So Z2 is 10 meters. So if it's 100 meters long, the elevation at location 2 is 10 meters higher. Um, now, how much energy loss is there as the water is flowing through the pipe? Okay, we have this formula that says the uh, H sub F is S sub F times L. Rearranging this one, 
We know S sub F. We calculated that earlier. It was 0 0.12232 meters per meter. And then the uh, length of the pipe is 100 meters. Now, the physical length of the pipe is going to be slightly longer than the horizontal length. But it turns out for angles even as steep as this that the, uh, the difference is negligible for the most part. So we'll just assume that the horizontal length and the inclined length are the same for simplicity. The head loss due to pipe friction is 12.232 meters. So that's how much energy is lost as the water is going through the pipe. And now we can substitute that into the energy equation. If we just rearrange the energy equation, P1 minus P2 is gamma times Z2 plus H sub F. Because we canceled out the velocity term on both sides, moved the unit weight over to the right-hand side of the equation, and this is talking about the, uh, the change in pressure from 1 to 2. So the unit weight of the water is 9810 newtons per meter cubed. And then the elevation at 2 is 10 meters and 12.232 meters of energy loss. Now before we finish these calculations, let me just ask you kind of from like a common sense basis. Just forget about equations, but common sense. Knowing what you know about the hydrostatic equation, you remember hydrostatics. If the water's not even flowing, if you go up through a fluid, the pressure decreases. If you go down through a fluid, the pressure increases. So from 1 to 2, since the elevation is higher, the pressure should be less at 2. I see some nodding heads, so that makes sense. The pressure is going to be less at 2 because 2 is at a higher elevation. And then the other reason why the pressure will be less at 2 is that there's energy loss due to pipe friction. So both of those things are acting in the same direction in this example, that the pressure is going to be less at location 2 because it's downstream from the perspective of pipe friction. And then it's also going to be less because of hydrostatics. So it makes sense that we're going to be combining these two terms together. And when we do, what we'll get is that the... Uh, the pressure change is 218,096 newtons per meter squared. So that's 218.1 kPa. That is how much the pressure goes down from 1 to 2. So the pressure at 1 is higher than the pressure at 2. If you have P1 and, and subtract P2, then that'll be a positive amount because the pressure at 1 is larger than the pressure at 2. So the pressure's decreasing. The pressure at 1 is higher, the pressure at 2 is less. Why did the pressure go down from 1 to 2? Because of pipe friction and because of the pipe being inclined. So this is just an example that shows us if we know the shear stress, how we can relate that to things like um, energy grade line, and pressure changes in a system. So you can use this concept on a couple of the homework problems. You know, this example is just basically to set the fundamental groundwork for a couple of the first problems on the homework assignment. You know, rearranging different formulas similar to this to, uh, to find the relationship between shear stress, friction factor, pressure changes, and so on. So let me uh, bring the last part of that example up on the screen in case people uh, are going to look at the video later on. So what we did is we, we canceled out the terms of the energy equation that we already knew or that were the same on the left side and the right side. So the velocity isn't changing through a constant diameter pipe. Continuity says that velocity in and velocity out in a pipe is the same. We just said by definition our elevation datum will start with 0 at location 1, so Z2 is 10 meters. So any questions about that problem and how we calculated the pressure change in the pipe?
Okay. Um, you may remember in fluid mechanics that you started off with the Bernoulli's equation before you talked about the energy equation. They look similar. They have some of the same terms. There's a velocity head term, a pressure head term, elevation term. There's three terms on the left side and the right side, but the energy equation accounts for energy loss between one and two, whereas the Bernoulli equation says that energy is conserved along a streamline in the direction of flow. The Bernoulli equation doesn't quite know how to handle friction losses, but the energy equation estimates it empirically. So we use the Bernoulli equation for like uh, when pipe diameters are changing to know how the velocity um, will, in the case of a decrease in velocity, how the pressure would go up. And um, the pressure change is related to both a velocity change but also due to friction losses. So a big part of our course is just using different friction, friction loss empirical equations. And a fundamental equation is one that's just based in like the laws of science, whereas an empirical equation is one that's based on observation and curve fitting and kind of coming up with the best guess on how to estimate something. So the Darcy-Wiesbach equation is pretty accurate but it's an empirical equation. It's, it's not fundamentally based in the uh, first laws of physics. It's just curve fitting. And so are the other friction loss formulas that you'll learn besides the Darcy-Wiesbach equation. Um, a piezometer is a way of physically measuring the hydraulic grade line. So as water is flowing through a pipe, the water level rises in a piezometer to an elevation which reflects the pressure in the pipe at that location. So if the piezometer is lower someplace, it means that the pressure at that location is lower, but it means that the pressure is lower because of a decrease uh, that was caused by friction losses. Like if the water was static in a conduit like this, like if the water wasn't flowing, then the water level would rise to the same height in both piezometers if conditions were static. The only reason why there's going to be a difference in water level in the piezometer is if water is flowing and the uh, pressure change is caused by friction. And so um, the line that gets traced by connecting the dots between piezometers is the hydraulic grade line. And it's the combination of pressure head and elevation head at a given location. And um, it was from observing changes in the hydraulic grade line that Darcy-Wiesbach equation is derived because we could measure the change in pressure and elevation. We can observe a length that separates two locations, know the velocity of flow, know some characteristics about the diameter, and then there would be a proportionality factor F that uh, explains the change in pressure. And then it was a lot of different uh, ways that they related uh, F to empirical things like the relative roughness and the Reynolds equation. But the Darcy-Wiesbach equation helps to explain the slope of the, of the hydraulic grade line and the energy grade line in the case of a, uh, of a closed conduit flow that has steady and uniform flow. Um, the uh, slope of the energy grade line is independent of the pipe slope. We saw that on this earlier problem, that the pipe can be going up and the pressure can be going down in close conduit. So the, uh, the two slopes are independent of each other. Now the last thing just to talk about, if you'll allow me one more minute, because I know it's 1150. We'll come back to this on Friday, but I wanted to mention that there's something shear velocity, V star, that's just a combination of the Darcy-Wiesbach equation and the relationship between uh, energy loss and shear stress. And it is a way of basically just rearranging uh, symbols and canceling out the units so that you could express um, shear stress. Instead of newtons per meter squared, you can express shear stress with units of velocity. And that can be useful um, depending on the situation, if we're trying to figure out the uh, friction factor in a situation with a fluid that is uh, 
of a known velocity, but we don't know the shear stress that's being applied. So we'll take another look at the shear velocity when we get together in class on Friday. Just remember that uh, for now, it is imperative and urgent that you get a hold of the textbook. And I'd encourage you to start working on the homework assignment. It's due on Wednesday, but based on the examples we went through today, you could already make some good headway on the homework. So I'll see you on Friday. Well, the, uh, the main thing that you need to solve the homework is the, uh, the kinematic viscosity, which I wrote on the board during the example today. Mm -hmm. uh, I think, you know, that's something you need to look up. But the, the homework isn't problems from the book. Have you looked at the homework already? Yeah, so it's not book problems. I can just look up the, the values online that use I think so, yeah. There's examples in the book that would be useful potentially to solve the homework, but you know we've also worked through some examples in class.